Bonjour and welcome to our panelists and participants from around the world. My name is Chantal Chetlako Magata and I'm the coordinator of the Universal Peace Federation for Europe. And it's a pleasure to greet you to this webinar. We have a translation into French and Russian and the chat icon is for remarks, information and the bios. For questions to the panelists, please use the Q&A icon. Some of them will be answered by our staff in the different languages and a few by one of our four panelists. I'm looking forward to a very interactive webinar. So what has motivated UPF to organize webinars on the Korean Peninsula? The UPF founders were both born in what is today North Korea. They share the destinies of millions of Korean people who fled from the North during the Korean War leaving relatives behind. The longing for a reunited homeland is still shared by many. This is what prompted our founders to make their historical visit to Pyongyang 30 years ago to meet with President Kim Il-sung. At that time, Sun Myung Moon was considered an enemy because of his clear stand against worldwide communism and the Chuche ideology. He had experienced three years of harsh conditions in a North Korean labor camp from which he was liberated by the United Nations forces in October 1950. Nevertheless, the meeting in 1991 resulted in many fruitful enterprises like the initiation by our founders in 1998 of the first car factory ever to be developed in North Korea. Investing in this very limited market was not a profitable venture, but the name of the cars, Pyonghua, meaning peace in Korean, illustrates well our founder's philosophy. To bring reconciliation, you need to gain the trust of the other party and go beyond your self-interest. It is the same philosophy that prompts his wife, Hak Jahan Moon, to continue launching initiatives around the globe. Just 13 months ago, she invited thousands of prominent figures to a summit in Seoul. Among other projects, she will be shortly announcing Think Tank 2022. It's a worldwide group of experts in politics, academics, religion, business, and the media who can contribute with their knowledge and experience to the Korean reunification. Also, she will convene a summit in North or South Korea, as well as fact-finding tours by journalists and other leaders. We sincerely hope that, dear panelists and auditors, you will support these initiatives. The discussions on the reunification of the Korean Peninsula held by UPF in all the regions around the world since last November underline the chances and difficulties in great part because of the conflicting interests of powerful nations like China, Russia, Japan, and the United States, all of which bear a significant responsibility for the division of the peninsula. We believe that Europe has an essential role to play as well in this process by reminding the people that it is possible to unite after decades of wars and enmity. I myself lived in South Korea for three years, and it's 30 years ago, and I experienced a deep-hearted and hard-working and really ambitious people, proud of their cultural heritage and ready to overcome challenges. I felt like I was in a big family. In my recent visits, however, I observed that the economically developed Korea had undergone harmful individualistic trends. Our founders have always emphasized and practiced a culture of heart in all their activities. Could the process of the reunification of the Korean Peninsula become an example of a new paradigm in which economic development goes hand in hand with the development of the heart of living for the sake of others? Many questions will be dealt with in the discussions today, and I'm looking forward to very interesting and insightful presentations. Without further ado, I will introduce our MC. Dr. Claude Bigley. 
He's the founder and president of Samio Suisse and a former member of the Swiss parliament. He has a PhD in economics, a master of law, and a master of international relations. He has held leading positions in important organizations and companies around the globe. Dr. Begley has been dealing with a wide spectrum of sectors, such as support for innovation and startups, clean techs, and the environment. Dr. Begley, the floor is yours. Oh, you're muted. You're mute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chantal, and hi, everybody. Uh, the topic of our today meeting is to talk about which economic model would enable North Korea to develop while ensuring peaceful rapprochement with the Korea Peninsula. Behind that, I see three key words. Uh, it's important to know economic model. When we speak about North South Korea, one thing about the atomic powers, tensions, wars, here we want to talk about the economy. Second, we talk about enablers, about facilitating, about processes, not about static positions, but how to get from here to there. And third, of course, is peaceful transition. How can we ensure the end result is not just economic growth, the end result is a reunification of the peninsula? Of course, there are a lot of preconceived ideas when we talk about, especially North Korea. It's not known by us. There's a lot of propaganda on both sides, and sometimes we are lacking objectivity from side and side. There are opposite ideologies, but actually there is one Korean identity. There is, despite the pure cultural side, there is a culture of hardworking, learning, a search for excellence, which probably are common denominator. Unified Korea as a nation, might be we sometimes underestimate that a threat to others the power of a unified korean economy could be similar to the gdp of japan and not everybody sees that as possible even china may on one side like but on the other side be a bit afraid of a too powerful neighbor of course less than china but still uh, the real issue is that is the antagonism between the US and China. It's not North and South Korea. It's US and China, the two superpowers. And then US has a number of proxies. One of them is South Korea. So how in that big game will the peninsula reunification be played? And finally, when I talk about economic models, three models come to my mind. Of course, is the East-West Germany, reunification, uh, lesson learned. It's also the Chinese economic model, which is communist, but at the same time with market economy. And it's uh, countries like Vietnam or um, uh, Mongolia, which have had successful transitions. So hence the question to our panelists, how weak is really North Korea? Probably North Korea is not like Russia in the 70s. It's not that all the shops are empty. It's not that they're unable to do things. So how weak is it or, or not so weak? Second, what is the impact of the sanction? Does it mean that it weakens the country? Or on the contrary, it strengthens the will for a certain outer sea? Third, uh, how to avoid uh, a takeover of the North Korea economy by the South? It should be something which is a win-win. Uh, fourth, what are the social costs for the reunification? 
an integration of Korea is obviously to be thought in the local context of China, Japan, and the other Asian countries. So what's the impact on the rest of the Eastern Asia? Uh, should we start with large scale industries or small scale industries? And what is the speed? What is the speed possible? What is the fastest possible speed, but where possible is in the center? How can the economy open up? Those are the questions with the cultural aspect as well, which we are going to ask to our four very distinguished panelists. So the first of them is Mr. Keith Bennett. Mr. Keith Bennett is from the UK. He's a deputy chairman of the 48 Group Club. He's deputy chairman of the Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong Il uh, Foundation. He is somebody with a depth of knowledge about what is North Korea. He has traveled, he has visited, he knows it inside out. And uh, he's somebody who goes beyond the preconceived ideas by trying to share his vision of what is North Korea. Keith, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Claude and Chantal, and all the friends at UPF for arranging this meeting and inviting me to speak. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think the theme of this meeting embodies an important truth that economic development and the connections it makes and the prosperity it builds is also one of the best ways to build peace and prevent war. I'm speaking today in a personal capacity, but in the United Kingdom, as you've just heard, I am the deputy chair of a business organization called the 48 Group Club. In China, we are known as the Icebreakers. Back in 1953, which was before I was born, we took the very first trade mission from any Western country to the then newly formed People's Republic of China. The founders of the 48 Group, who included Lord Boyd Orr, the first Director General of the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, had been forged in the horrors of the Great Depression and the Second World War. They were not motivated simply by business, but even more by a belief that mutually beneficial and equal trade would prevent war and defend peace. In the course of my professional life, I've also tried to engage in such icebreaking with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, DPRK, also of course known as North Korea. I first visited China in 1981 and the DPRK in 1983 and have traveled back to both countries very frequently, observing their development ever since, with the exception of the last couple of years when personal circumstances made travel impossible for me. And of course, in the last year, travel has been made impossible by the COVID pandemic. The first thing I would like to say is that if you have not visited the DPRK, almost everything you have read and heard about the country is likely to be either untrue or at best partial and one-sided. The DPRK is not large in size or population, but it is a country of enormous economic potential, as uh, Chantal has uh, hinted at. Prior to 19, oh, sorry, I think Claude, forgive me, prior to 1945, the whole of the Korean peninsula was rapaciously exploited by Japanese colonialism. Again, the whole of the peninsula was devastated in the war of 1950 to 53. After the war, although the DPRK received some support from other socialist countries, the level of external support could not be compared to that received by the ROK in the South. Yet it was the North that rehabilitated its economy first and outpaced its compatriots in development for at least a couple of decades. Certainly on my first visit in 1983, it was very clear that at that time, North Korea had a higher standard of living than China. After Japan, North Korea was the first country in Northeast Asia to industrialize, to have a majority of its people living in towns and cities. Literacy is universal and Korean people are industrious and hardworking. The country is known to be sitting on a vast array of raw materials with a value in the trillions of dollars. Many of North Korea's economic problems arise first from the division of a natural economic unit that existed as a single political entity for centuries, even millennia. For example, much of Korea's arable land is in the south. 
and also from an international environment in which North Korea has been progressively more unable to attract investment from or even to trade normally with other countries. Addressing this latter issue is the most vital question in realizing the goals advanced by this meeting. Because of their geographical location and long historical experience, Korean people place a great emphasis on independence. In the North, this is known as Juche, and like many Korean expressions, it defies simple translation. Often rendered as self-reliance, it rejects the blind following and copying of others. But according to North Koreans' understanding, as opposed to the caricature generally presented in the West, this does not equate to a closed door. It does not re it reject equal exchanges or learning what is useful from others. Inevitably, much of this exchange and learning is centered on China. Because of historic and contemporary similarities of the political system, cultural affinities, and the, to me, undeniable fact that China's economic transformation over recent decades constitutes one of the greatest achievements in human history. Likewise, other regional countries, including Russia, Mongolia, Vietnam, and Cambodia, can provide useful reference points, not least through their also either being or having been socialist countries like North Korea. But what North Korea has in mind is certainly not a carbon copy of China or any other country nor is it accurate to view the DPRK as some kind of recalcitrant pupil tagging along from the back of the class. The size of China's population and hence potential market simply cannot be compared to that even of a future reunified Korea. China was also able to begin its economic reforms against a highly favorable international political environment, which certainly does not pertain at the present time in the case of the DPRK. China could kickstart its economic liftoff essentially by turning itself into the cheap labor manufacturing and assembly factory of the world with a near limitless supply of labor power from a then poverty stricken countryside. North Korea absolutely does not have that amount of labor power and much of what it does have has already been urbanized for a couple of generations. Again, contrary to much popular belief, the DPRK whilst cherishing its self-reliance and independence, has long been interested in inserting itself into the international marketplace. The country's first joint venture law, adopted in the 1980s, actually predated the equivalent legislation in China. This legislation has been progressively augmented over the years, and business delegations and lawyers who I have taken to the country have generally been favorably surprised by its detail and sophistication. In various instances, and over a considerable period, the DPRK has actually shown itself to be more flexible and more innovative than China in terms of the economic collaborations it has been prepared to envisage. It has been prepared to envisage. We can see this in the permission given to open casinos, whatever one thinks of that particular industry, and the two casinos in the country are, in my opinion, quite rightly off limits to local citizens. In the previous operation of the Kumgangsan tourist zone with Hyundai Asan, or the major investment in mobile telephony, first by Loxley from Thailand and then by Araskam from Egypt. Shortly after Kim Jong un became the leader of the country following the death of his father, plans were announced to create special economic zones, each with its own specialism in every province of the DPRK and the planned major tourist area centered on the coastal city of Wonsan was also earmarked as a site for major foreign investment. What is preventing these plans from coming to fruition is not a lack of interest on the part of the DPRK, but the political and security environment. In recent years in particular, successively more draconian sanctions have increasingly rendered most business with the DPRK impossible. Whatever one thinks of President Trump, and in general, I'm no fan, it was, his, it was to his credit that he at least tried to resolve this issue. Naturally, he had more than one reason to attempt this, but certainly on a number of occasions, he has shown an acute awareness of the DPRK's economic potential. And at his Singapore press conference, right after his first summit with Kim Jong-un, when hopes were quite high, he remarked that he looked at these things from the perspective 
of someone with a background in real estate, an interesting perspective. We have to wait and see what the policy of the Biden administration will be. And with everything that's in its in tray, I think we may have to wait some time. But certainly, neither China nor Russia currently have any appetite to strengthen the sanctions regime and quite some appetite to mitigate or ameliorate it, perhaps starting with humanitarian issues. Nor do they currently have any great appetite to do the United States any favours. Progress on the economic front can contribute to peace and security, but a breakthrough is needed on the peace and security front for there to be progress on economic exchange and cooperation. There is a vicious circle here that needs to be broken with courage, imagination, and new thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Keith. I keep some words on what you said, which I think will be to be discussed later, and maybe the others either to challenge or to substantiate it. But DPRK, through the Duce Self-Reliance, rejects blind following. It's no carbon copy of neither the Chinese model nor the Western model. And also you said that it's more flexible and more innovative than several of the China policies. Will be very interesting to have also a feedback and a position from the others. And in that sense, we are very lucky to have now Tal Reshef from Israel, who's a lecturer, a specialist on global market economics with an insight in culture, not, not only the culture as we see with theaters, but very much the socio-economical culture, what enables or what doesn't enable things to happen. He's advising Israeli high-tech companies. And I, I'd like to thank Chantal for the choice because when we prepared for that meeting, I could perceive that uh, Tal has a very uh, different point of view. So it's going to be interesting to hear or to confront the views of Keith and the views of Tal. And I would be very interested to hear the tal position versus what we have just heard being a vigorous partisan of the system as it exists in south korea so i think it's fair because objectivity means that we should always have listen one point of view and the other point of view so tal the floor is yours Thank you very much, Mr. Baglens. Thank you very much, Mr. Bennett, uh, for your uh, in the deep sights uh, of uh, the, the issue. And uh, I uh, take the things uh, beyond the, 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 the definition of this seminar, which is the, the, the economic um, aspect of a possible unification of the two Koreas of the peninsula uh, into the human issue, into the human uh, view of the things, because we are talking about a two um, groups of people that are considered as one nation because they are both Koreans and because they are have, they have shared heritage, shared history, shared language. And uh, quite naturally, we can say, well, yes, they are the same uh, nation or even more than that, uh, they have this, they share the same culture, but I am not 100% sure about it. And uh, we see that, uh, we see many um, examples of this, uh, of people coming from the same uh, nation and not necessarily sharing the same culture. We experienced it in my country, in Israel, uh, after the creation of the country in 1948, people, all of them Jews, came from all around the world, from Morocco, from Germany, from Russia, from Yemen, and so on, uh, as we usually say, from 70 people and language and country. And uh, we found out the morning after that, yes, we share very important things that define us as one nation, as one people, but not necessarily the same uh, culture. And we are still struggling to create something, a melting pot out of all this uh, more than 70 years afterwards. And maybe the term of melting pot should not be used. Well, this is one of the ideas that, that were raised. 
we see it in many other places, even in countries that are living together, that the people are sharing the daily life. If we see the clash between the supporters of Putin and the supporters of Navalny in these days, one may ask himself, are they representing one culture? I'm not very sure about the answer. And if you take a look at the struggle on the Capitol Hill, some weeks ago in Washington, are both sides of this event uh, Americans in the full term of the saying? Uh, are they pre representing the same uh, culture? And what I am saying quite bluntly, the answer is no. We have an expectation which is not realistic. Uh, just as one nation in one country can be uh, formed of more than one culture, of course, the same happens when we are talking about two uh, groups of people on two sides of the border that were not sharing the same regime in the last 70 years or so. And uh, we could say we have an example under our hands, which is the example of unification of Germany. It's a very um, teaching uh, example because um, West Germany, a dedicated a huge fortune in order to assemble the two groups of people together. Now, after some dozens of years following those events, uh, we have a very stabilized country, uh, quite peaceful related to others, very prosperous in many terms, but fully, uh, uh, and the, the economic uh, unification really did take place, I may say, even though the, the, the ex-DDR area is still not on the same height as the West, still it has prospered quite nicely. But socially speaking, we see something very interesting that should be alarming the Koreans that are dealing with possible unification, which is that um, aggressions against uh, immigrants in the Eastern side are, are much more frequent than in the Western side. The popularity of uh, extreme right-wing groups in the Eastern side are more uh, uh, widespread than in the Western side. And we can explain it by the fact that those people from the ex-DDR, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, lived for dozens of years under the regime that his policy, his way of saying things were, they are the good guys, us, they are the bad guys, okay, you know who they are, and there's the way to tackle it, usually force. Now, this paradigm is transferred into the situation of modern Germany in the 21st century, and who are the good guys? With the Germans. Who are the bad guys? Well, let's take a look. I may say uh, the immigrants, of course, they're stealing our jobs. You know, the, they don't do not share the same culture with us. They don't usually uh, share the same uh, um, way of living. They have different uh, um, uh, religion. So taking this paradigm, we see where to refer it and what are the means? Means of aggression. And they, uh, of course, I cannot put all the East Germans, ex-East Germans in one group. Many of them have changed. Angela Merkel is a, a beautiful example. But still, there is a vast big uh, number of people that still see it and still are different on a personal view, on the cultural view, on the social view from the majority of the West uh, Germans. Now, Let's take all those details into Korea. We have people that have been closed down uh, in their country more than in the there, more, and, uh, uh, and for more time. And they live in the, uh, under lower uh, conditions than in the ex-DDR. They were closed from other ideas more than in the DDR. Now, and they have, we wish them to be integrated on this or that time in the future into South Korea uh, with the wealth of South Korea, with the good wills of the South Koreans, and uh, with the um, experience that South Korea had with the factors integrating into the country in South Korea. And this history, a part of what we learned from the East Germans, teaches us that things are very complicated. We saw people coming, the factors coming there with no social background that allows them to mingle in what they find, with no profession that fits the modern uh, economy, with not even understanding of basic things like opportunities, like career, like bank accounting. 
very basic things. Most, a very big percentage of them do not succeed economically there. They feel like, you know, being casted out. Uh, the children in school sometimes um, also included. And now this is when we are integrating some hundreds of people uh, or some tens of people on a year basis. What will happen when we do this process in front of 22 million people? Uh, some of them coming from high ranks where they were participating in the activities of the DPRK, whatever they will be, each one with his view of the things, uh, integrated 22 million people, I believe is not an economic issue. It is not an issue of financing. It is an issue of creating a possibility for them to integrate uh, culturally, and they are not the, culture, the same culture. According to my idea, of course, everybody is free to choose another way of seeing things. I see uh, DPRK people as uh, presenting another culture, maybe even another people. I talked quite often with people from South Korea about North Korea, and they told me, look, my grandfather had friends and even family on that side of uh, the, the 38 uh, line, but I don't share it. I don't know them. I don't have anything to do with a part of the theoretical um, notion that they are Koreans. I don't have anything in common with them. And now I have to finance this huge uh, transition of them to our country. So we have problems from both sides. And it raises some questions. I'm, uh, I apologize, I don't have uh, uh, solutions to present. I have ideas. I'm not sure which of them is the best. I, I'm sure that uh, uh, doing it in one blow, tomorrow morning we are in United Country, may be a, a disaster. Because in the morning after, these North Koreans will be the animals in the natural reserve to be visited by the rich uh, mm -hmm. neighbors uh, that come with their money, offering them very low rank uh, uh, work. Uh, this may be disastrous for the self-esteem of the North Koreans. This will uh, push them, like uh, in the case of these Germans, to look for alternatives. Alternatives may be um, alcoholism, alternatives may be uh, aggression, Alternatives may be, and this is a very big uh, uh, challenge, China, because uh, in the unification of Germany, there was no alternative. There was the West, and that's all. Be there or be square. Now there is an alternative. China is seen as an alternative. And if 22 million in the northern part of the United Korean area will be uh, frustrated by the way that they are looked down by their uh, southern uh, neighbors or south southern cousins and attracted by the model beyond uh, the, the yellow river this may cause a very very deep uh, um, disruption on the way of unification and a big problem ahead so the cultural and personal and social issue i suggest is the main point uh, to put uh, the uh, division inside and thank you for giving me the floor Thank you very much, Tal. I think it's very smart how you play this question of the culture. Your example of the assault on capital versus the people who represented the <coughs> mainstream vision of Washington. Is it the same culture? Um, probably it's the same country and probably they have institutions which avoid excesses. And we have seen how finally the US institution have helped to avoid going completely crazy and banana. But those are very different ways of looking at the same reality. So I would have a follow-up question. When you talk about East Germany and West Germany, who has paid the highest price to the reunification? Is it the West Germans? who injected billions and billions, a little bit a fond perdu in the East Germany? Or is it the East Germans who lost, I like very much your word, for me it's a key word, their self-esteem because they became maybe not a zoo in East Germany, but um, they had a feeling that it was a takeover of East Germany by West Germany and hence, the temptation, well, in the case of Korea, to look at a big neighbor, for example. Uh, 
So who is the winner? Who paid the highest price? And how can you correlate that example to the situation of North and South Korea? As Buddha told us, um, happiness does not lie in uh, achieving things. It lies in uh, achieving our expectations. And the lower the expectations, the higher uh, is the achievement. And I believe this is what's happening here. I would suggest even that DDR uh, and were not, on the same way that I described uh, some minutes earlier, were not one nation in terms of one culture. So those in West Germany that expected things to happen and not to pay a price, and each one for himself, lost because they lost, as far as I remember, about $2 trillion. That's a lot, that's quite a lot, if, because this is their expectation. The West Germans that embraced this unification because they saw things beyond money were the winners. On the same side, on the same time on the, Eastern side, the same happened. Those Eastern Germans, they said, okay, okay, we want to be rich, we want to be part of a prosperous uh, country, and uh, we, we expect them because we are coming from a state capital, a, a state a country, you know, a country that finances everything and pushed forward uh, everything. We expect the, the, uh, the regime to finance everything, and we are going to be prosperous by their uh, um, investment. Uh, I believe they, uh, they were disappointed, but those in the East Germany who said, okay, we are becoming bigger Germany with our brothers on the other side of uh, the wall. Uh, it is not only the question of prosperity, it's the question of identity, of history, of future, of freedom, many other things, I believe they were the winners. So I guess uh, following your uh, very intelligent uh, uh, questions, I may say, uh, the answer is complex, at least by four groups, at least. Thank you very much. I'd like now to give the word to Irina Korgun. So that's fantastic. We went from the UK to Israel and now to Russia. Uh, Irina is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Economics, IAS in Moscow, a specialist of trade and economics and development in East Asia. Uh, Irina knows very well South Korea, she worked there, and at the same time, probably being much more exposed to the reality of the South than to the reality of the North, uh, she has extremely interesting thoughts about sanctions and the effectiveness of the sanctions and the impact of the sanctions on what happens on the other side. So, Irina, uh, we are very interested also to listen to you. And when I hear sanctions, I can't avoid uh, thinking that Russia is also receiving some sanctions. So, I mean, it's uh, we, we are all part and parcel of the same reality. So the floor is yours and we listen to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Claude Begley, for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm very honored to be on this panel today with my distinguished co-panelists. Uh, I learned a lot from the previous <coughs> presentations. Sorry. As uh, uh, Professor Begle uh, briefly mentioned, I'll touch upon sanctions for the sake of also treating the subject, as uh, Mr. Bennett has said, breaking the vicious cycle of political tensions on the Korean Peninsula. And I'll uh, talk of three points that I think are quite relevant for solving the, Korea, the North Korean problem, which are effectiveness of sanctions, versus productiveness of sanctions. Uh, second point is why indeed do we need to engage with North Korea? And third on possible solutions to economic development of DPRK. So the first point, effectiveness of sanctions versus productiveness of sanctions. Uh, today, we just only need to click on the internet and type in North Korea to see that everyone is discussing a question, do sanctions really work, starting from experts and to the general public, because everyone wants some quantifiable measure to understand, are really sanctions hurting North Korea? And for me, this is um, kind of 
some problem of approaching the issue of sanctions in principle. Because if you put effectiveness front and central over the issue of North Korean nuclear program, uh, we divert attention from other also important things that are not captured by the notion of effectiveness. Because effectiveness is an economic notion that requires certain quantitative assessment. That's why everyone is asking so how much North uh, Korean export fell, how much import fell, and uh, how much they received for their migrant workers or any other things. But these uh, such things actually overshadow the primary goal of sanctions. And if we remember, UN resolution stated that the primary goal of sanctions is to stop prolifer proliferation of nuclear weapon, ensuring peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and of the Northeast Asian region. And if we ask those sanctions productive in achieving those goals, did they produce their original results that sanctions were aimed at? I'm not sure that the answer will be quite definitive. As we see, North Korea hadn't stopped its nuclear or missile program or any other military program. But on the contrary, according to the recent report by UN experts, uh, sanctions didn't stop, but actually stimulated the North Korean government to go ahead with its missile program. And if you wish to innovate and improve the effect and the effectiveness here indeed uh, of their long range missiles so that they can now reach different regions of the world and thus make a threat to many people around the globe. So sanctions were counterproductive in achieving the results. And when we talk about effectiveness, we just not paying attention to these effects of second and third order effects that sanctions indeed produce. And speaking more broadly on the second and third order effects, sanctions uh, effectiveness actually doesn't allow us to capture it because those effects are not really quantifiable. Uh, how can we calculate that North Korea is pushed out into the gray zone, which is very, very poorly controlled by various international structures? How do we quantify that it starts to produce um, uh, drugs and uh, engage in a cyber activity. These are all things that it has to do in order to find self-finance itself because the international community in a way reject uh, North Korea to engage in legal activity, legally uh, export things it can export and earn those money. And by imposing sanctions, actually international community uh, 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 loses uh, opportunity to engage with North Korea, to engage in legal and uh, in a predictable and sustainable way. And instead what we get an unpredictable <clears throat> country that, uh, that, that can ensure its own um, existence through holding onto the weapon. So I'm not sure that this is the right approach Already in 2006, many specialists on North Korea who know country deeply, both culturally, politically, and economically, have warned that sanctions won't be effective in achieving any results uh, in denuclearization if we start with sanctions. The only way forward is to engage in a dialogue with the North and try and um, um, persuade them to go along a more peaceful line and also engage economically because economic engagement provides security not only for the country itself but for its people. It slowly involves many, um, uh, many citizens into economic activity and teaches them that it's okay to cooperate with the West. They don't need to be afraid because with the propaganda that is very active in North Korea, many citizens are actually afraid of uh, engaging with the West. And we, and partially we as an international community are to blame because we didn't show any uh, 
uh, really friendly science of engaging with North uh, Korea. This was on my second point, so why we should really engage in order to uh, have a predictable partner, in order to cooperate in uh, not in a gray zone, but in a space that is observable and is predictable. And my third point would be, so what are applicable solutions to North Korean development problems? Well, I uh, no, do agree with uh, Mr. Uh, Claude, uh, Big, uh, sorry, with Mr. Bennett that uh, North Korea cannot compare with China in terms of labor. It doesn't have as much labor as China did when it stepped on the capitalist development um, uh, way, but, uh, at the same time, North Korea is a country with abundant <coughs> labor because um, uh, still its uh, labor is mostly in agriculture. And in order to start development, it needs to transfer labor from agricultural sector to the industry, industrial sector. And there, there should be mechanism of this transition. And also another point that I would like to make uh, is that uh, North Korea is essentially an East Asian country. So naturally, when it will decide for its uh, economic development, it will look at examples of other uh, East Asian countries. And of course, uh, Vietnam, Singapore, and Hong Kong, and um, South Korean experience will be relevant. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. And, um, uh, the thing is that all of those countries have started with a strong state and well it won't be it will be unavoidable to start with a uh, strong state in the north with regard to economic development well i have a few more points to say but i'll save them for discussion and for the questions thank you very thank much for listening thank you very much irina <clears throat> i think you are raising a very interesting point when you said that the sanctions probably are having a reverse effect to the one which is searched, i.e. to increase the determination of North Korea uh, to be independent. And as Keith mentioned at the very beginning, and I think his comment was totally right, there is a wish not to follow any existing way, but to find their own way. And I was personally surprised in North Korea to see that as a result of the sanction, they are producing more or less everything by themselves. So it increased the determination of a certain odyssey. Well, that, <clears throat> that will be a question which in a moment we will ask to our parliamentarian because that's going to be very interesting to see what is the view of an uh, EU parliamentarian on the question of the sanctions, the effectiveness of the sanction in North Korea, uh, in Iran, against Russia, etc. But the question to you, Irina, is if you want, because there are a few things which everybody would wish to see changing in North Korea. If, if you want to change things, it's either the stick or the carrot. Uh, if it is not the sanctions, because you say that the sanctions probably are not so effective, what would you propose to try to start the process of a change of mentality? Uh, do you mean change of mentality in the North? In North or? Korea. So if you say that sanctions are not so effective, which personally I tend to agree with you, what would be what would you propose in order to go in the right direction uh, it's a, a rather difficult question to answer because many people have thought about it and so far didn't find an appropriate solution so i i'm afraid i'm not the one to to give one but at the same time as i mentioned to have a dialogue and treat North Korea as an equal partner rather than like um, a small mice which is taken to a corner and is pressed further by the sanctions. What you get is an angry mice that can bite you. And I don't think that anyone wishes that scenario. So really having constructive uh, dialogue and uh, 
well, in a way, ensuring that its uh, leadership won't be um, uh, displaced uh, if um, um, uh, if there, there will be some changes, because one of the reasons why North Korea is holding on to its uh, missile program is because they are afraid there are no guarantees of their security. So we, before answering how do we change mentality of North Korea, we should think how do we really guarantee that uh, other parties will stick to the proposed I don't know, program and uh, also how do we ensure certain stability of regime and certain security guarantees for the regime so that they are interested in engaging with others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irina. Now I think we will move to our fourth speaker, as they always say last but not least, um, Mr. Denis uh, Ratke, or Honorable Denis Ratke. He's German, so he's somewhere in the middle between uh, the UK and Germany and Israel, geographically. Uh, he's a member of the European Parliament, and interestingly enough as well, he's a member of the delegation of the EU Parliament with the Korean Peninsula. He has a background as a unionist, and it will be very interesting to hear from him. Uh, we are here talking about Europe. So what is the position of Europe? What are the tools that Europe has at hand to try to play a role in that game? Because it's very much a US-China ping pong. Uh, now, Europe can really play a role, especially because Europe is more neutral. So Europe could be a facilitator. And uh, that role of facilitator may be much more important than the role of the protagonists. So we'd be very interested to hear your views uh, there was a question of the sanction, which is a specific mm. question, yeah. but your views on the situation in the peninsula and how Europe can help to find a solution. Yeah. Please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Claude. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to uh, share a few uh, uh, thoughts uh, of, of, of mine uh, on this uh, very important topic. I will try to integrate the, the, the question of the, uh, of the sanctions in, in what, what I'm, I'm going to say. And uh, as, as Claude said, there are two points which make me quite interesting uh, for, uh, for, for Korean diplomats, because the one thing is I'm from Germany and the other thing is I'm a member of the European Parliament. And uh, let me start with, uh, with the first point. Um, it has already been mentioned in in uh, in in in, in uh, uh, previous statements that of course uh, our history in in Germany, our reunification and and the the process before the reunification is very important, uh, especially for the for for politicians and and diplomats in in uh, in, uh, in in South Korea because it is. It is a frequent question: uh, How did you manage all that, and uh, and so on? Uh, so uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, this, this, this is of, of great interest. And on the other hand, uh, as you said, the role of the uh, of the um, European Union is, in my eyes, uh, a bit underestimated. Uh, when you when you look into the media, there's always a question. Uh, 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 what what is what is China doing at the moment? Uh, are they uh, will they go on with with supporting the system uh, or not? And the other thing is uh, what is uh, what are the United States of uh, America doing? Trump tried out everything. He started with uh, uh, um, insulting Kim as little rocket man, and he he ended up with uh, Kim is one of my best friends. Uh, uh, and nothing nothing worked really out. But the position of uh, of the European Union in my eyes is completely underestimated uh, because we have the 
the the opportunity and uh, i i know that uh, uh, also uh, in in north korea there there, uh, there there is an impression that europe can be uh, in, in german we have the expression of ehrlicher makler and uh, maybe you can translate it with uh, with the role of an honest broker i'm i'm not really sure if uh, uh, um, if, if 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 this is uh, a co correct interpretation for 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 what I what I mean, but but I think this this can be a, a European role. Of course, uh, Europe is never uh, um, a, can never be neutral uh, because uh, the European Union has always uh, to be on the side uh, of of a country uh, which is uh, valuing. Uh, 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 human rights and so on, and um, uh, and and not hurting uh, uh, human uh, human rights. But I think we we, we can play a role uh, in that. And uh, the question uh, how to go on with uh, with the sanctions. Uh, I I agree to to what uh, what what Dr. Korgun said that uh, not not in general. Uh, sanctions have to be an instrument, but. Uh, the, the the relationship and the development in North Korea showed uh, that the, the sanctions the, the sanctions regime uh, didn't really work out. And uh, if you want to learn from the uh, from the German reunification, uh, then we have to take into account what what really uh, uh, made, made the process start and the the process rolling because. It was not an not, not an event for for three or four weeks. It was a complete. Uh, uh, it was a process which uh, uh, enabled a German uh, reunification. And a very important point in this process has been. I always call it. Uh, uh, we helped in opening the windows. So uh, maybe it's difficult to to compare uh, the situation in. German Democratic uh, Republic and and uh, uh, and North Korea because uh, the, the system in North Korea is maybe more bolted uh, than than the uh, uh, DDR has ever been that that can be but but what we tried over over decades is opening the windows so that the people uh, from German Democratic uh, Republic had the opportunity to see what is happening in the West. How people are living uh, in the West, and I think uh, this has to be in the in the focus of our politics that we do everything uh, to open the, the the windows because this can uh, really uh, maybe start a, a kind of um, a, a kind of uh, regime change or a process uh, to uh, to to that. Uh, but th there are several points we we have to 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 take into account, and uh, we, which uh, uh, where you can see it is not one on one the, the same situation. Uh, the the cultural uh, aspect has been uh, already mentioned. I think the the question of uh, Confucianism uh, is is really one one of the keys uh, in this because uh, the question of loyalty. Of loyalty to people in charge, a loyalty to a system, and the question of piety is very important in in Confucianism. Uh, so, uh, one, please do not under underestimate that uh, when you when you want to 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 bring a process of of change into uh, into rolling. And uh, uh, another aspect is. Uh, what is about the society in, in, in South Korea? I talked about diplomats and I talked about politics, but uh, the, 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 the man on the street, we have now a country for 70 years uh, divided. So the people who really know Korean pe Peninsula as one country, uh, we have less people uh, th th that have this experience and we have new generations uh, for 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 them, it is normal to be uh, two 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 separate countries. So this this has also been uh, to, to to be taken into uh, account. And uh, then then maybe one one last point, um, and 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 that is that is maybe the the most crucial point. I like to ask you if you are the passenger in a crashing plane, would you throw away 
your one and only parachute you have? Would you throw it out of the window? <laughs> or when you are a passenger of the Titanic, would you would you would you uh, give up your lifeboat and your life vest if 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 you see what is happening? And what what is a parachute or the lifeboat of the Kim family is of course the nuclear weapon. And uh, in that very moment, the, the, they do not have it in their hands. They do not have a parachute. And if you if you if you don't find an answer for that and a solution where to go uh, for the for the Kim family and the question for their personal future. And of course, this this cannot be discussed public and on a marketplace. But this is this is to be honest a key question in that. Uh, a week ago, I I, I said to Claude, uh, uh, maybe uh, you, you Switzerland, your Swiss home could be a solution, a very nice place. Uh, yeah, but uh, stop joking now. But but this is uh, uh, this is a key question. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, th th these few points uh, for me, and uh, I'm looking forward now uh, uh, to the to the discussion with you. Thank you, Denis. I like very much what you said. I have a follow-up question, a double follow-up question. So, how can Germany, respectively Europe, play the honest broker role? And very much in line with your last statement, the parachute one, we have to accept that for some people who in the general opinion are not considered as angels, uh, there has to be something for them in the basket. If we offer something where it's simply um, you commit suicide, you can't ask them to really participate to the solution. So you can win, you can smash them, but it's not so easy that you smash them. It may lead to a very ugly thing, uh, not only in Peninsula, but uh, globally. So if you want, because it seems that today everybody agrees that we prefer to avoid the clash in the Peninsula. So you need to find a solution which is somehow a win-win, including what is for the Kim clan into the solution? So it's not going to come from the US, probably. Um, it could, who knows? But I mean, it has to involve more people. And Europe, as a kind of neutral player, is probably, or Switzerland, better placed to try to contribute to the solution. So what could be done? That's my question. And the very personal question inside that is a parliamentarian who tries to tell the truth for example supposing that the parliamentarian goes to north korea and sees and says what keith has said at the beginning of the meeting it's of course something which is politically incorrect so a parliamentarian has to be re-elected so you better shut up or say nothing or or hide 90 percent of what you have seen uh, but you're much better off by not being positive about a few things how can parliamentarians play a role as an honest broker, being honest, and up to which point can they take the risk of being honest, knowing that it may have a cost? You reply if you want or not. Yeah, I Dennis. reply because I'm an honest guy. So, <laughs> uh, but, but but let me let me let me start with a with a with a, a first uh, question, uh, although it is a bit uh, uh, complicated. I think um, uh, the, the the role of the honest broker uh, part of it could be uh, that we also uh, offer our our help, our support. Uh, we 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 talked about that uh, a few days ago. Uh, for, for me, it is clear that when you see the the cost of the German reunification, we are talking about around about two trillion euros. That is a uh, total cost of 
of German reunification, two trillion euros in words, two trillions. So, uh, and 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 the the, the 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 German Democratic Republic has been crashed, but I think it in compare with with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with North Korea, I think uh, the, the GDR has been a, 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 a well running business. So uh, the cost is probably much higher than these two trillions, and of course. Um, uh, the, the, the Korean Peninsula uh, also needs international help, and of course, uh, also from Europe. And I think we we can play a role in that, uh, also a financial uh, role, because it, it's in the world's interest that we uh, get a solution for 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 this uh, for this problem. So uh, this is a one point, and uh, maybe another point. Uh, I I don't know uh, if, if if offering uh, a nice place to live in and a safe place to live in. Uh, uh, this this is up to us. Maybe uh, it, it it could be up to us. Um, but f for me, again, this is this is a a key question. And you, you, as you told, that there are only two ways to 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 get a regime change. And and the, the one is uh, uh, to do it with uh, with power and with blood. Uh, but you, you never know what what, what then is happening. Uh, what is the result of that? And the other point is. Uh, uh, to do it over negotiation and and during a, a process but but then you have to deal also with people you maybe you do not like and uh, but but i think this this, this this is part of politics if we are only a trading and only dealing and only talking to people we like uh, the, the, the amount of people we are talking to uh, it's <laughs> It's very small, so um, I, I think this is our target. And, and the second point you mentioned, uh, yes, you are right. Uh, to uh, to to be honest, in every way, is 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 not not very difficult. Um, uh, but 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 for me, uh, I, I'm 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 debating a lot of uh, of hot potatoes. I'm uh, you already said I work for a trade union, and uh, uh, although I am um, a Christian Democrat, uh, not not always easy that relationship. And uh, what I'm telling about social politics, uh, not everyone in my party likes to hear. Uh, so I'm I, I really have no problems in, in in talking about hot potatoes also in my political family so uh, this yeah. is a normal, <laughs> normal business for me yeah. thank you very much we have thank you so much Dennis we are from the same family and it, I happen sometimes to also express my own views and not only to follow now the we have a question from the public uh, to Keith and the question is could we say that China left the capital of Marx down when it established the free market, private initiative and private property? Could North Korea take similar path for the economy? I personally like to expand a little bit on the question. We know that in China, it was always read an expert. And uh, well, we had the Mao and uh, uh, then Zhou Ping, then the Xi Jinping. So it's moving, it's sinusoidal. But the real question I see for countries like China, but it has been the case in, uh, in others, how, can, how is it possible to maintain the power of the party, the political power of the party, while opening the economy? And you gave a few hints already in your presentation. So, is the Chinese model a model which North Korea could follow? What are the differences in which you already gave three cases in your initial statement, but what are the cases where North Korea would differentiate themselves from the Chinese model? Keith. Well, thanks very much. And that's, uh, that's a very interesting, um, that, that's a very interesting uh, question. On, on a whole number of levels. And obviously, well, in terms of uh, to, to what extent is, is China a capitalist country or a socialist country or, or, or a mixture of both, obviously that's something that uh, can't, you know, no, we can't answer to our mutual satisfaction in a, in a few minutes. We could probably 
uh, debate and, and, and study it for days. Uh, certainly, I, I think that um, the, a lot of people in the West invested a lot of hope and belief over a long period of time that, uh, that uh, China was uh, leaving Marxism behind. I think one of the reasons for the very sharply deteriorated relations between China and the West uh, in, in the very recent period, although obviously not the only reason, but one reason is been a growing belief in the, in, uh, among many in the West that perhaps their view that, that China wished to turn its back on Marxism was uh, uh, perhaps misplaced or from their point of view over optimistic. The, um, certainly what um, uh, the, the road that China embarked upon with reform and opening up in, from the end of 1978 onwards is something that by and large was not followed um, by any other socialist country be before. Uh, certainly it was radically different from uh, the practice in the Soviet Union. There would be some, some similarities, but again, huge differences because of size and scale and so on, but some similarities perhaps with what had been followed in Yugoslavia from the late 1940s, or to, to some extent what was followed in Hungary um, under, under Janusz Kada. So, uh, but what's clear, I think, is that the Chinese model combines great diversity of, of, of economic of economic forms, a huge role of, from of the market, uh, but also maintains a very strong state sector and state-led economic development and an overall state guidance of the economy. And that's that's perhaps can be said to be an East Asian model uh, to, to, to some extent in that countries both capitalist and socialist in East Asia have followed variants of, of, of that model. The, um, the capitalism that, that existed and, and developed in the post-war period in, in Japan and South Korea, for example, is not the, uh, is not the laissez-faire uh, Anglo-Saxon model of capitalism. Uh, nor is it the um, really the the more kind of social capitalism that that's uh, existed in the Scandinavian countries and and to to a great to a great extent in in Germany uh, as well. So I think that there is you know there, there's a great deal uh, to be discussed and summed up as to to what the nature of the economic system is. In China, to to the extent that it might be uh, followed or otherwise in in the in North Korea, I, I already made comments about that in in my opening presentation. In that, I think that there will inevitably be things that that North Korea will be interested in that they will look at because of the whole the the contemporary very close relationship with China, the fact that the overwhelming majority of North Korea's foreign trade, at least at the moment, is with China. The fact that the two countries have uh, similarities in their present day political setup, but also long, long historical ties, uh, cult and cultural philosophical ties. And somebody's or one of my, one of my colleagues on this uh, on this webinar has already referred to the influence of Confucianism. So for all those things, there will be um, an, a great interest for sure in what's um, is what's happening in China and what what uh, what they've achieved. I think that. Um, uh, but but I think that, uh, as I've said before, that, that North Korea will be wanting to look at um, it, uh, the, the, the Chinese development. And I think that uh, some of the, although this is very, very much being reversed and, and, under Xi Jinping, but the, the loosening of the role of the party that, that did take place to a certain extent in the Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao periods would be something that North Korea would be um, keen to, to to avoid. Obviously, you have now a lot of people in, in Pyongyang who are living sig significantly better lives than than, pe than people in, in in other parts of the country. But I think that uh, the great disparities of wealth and, and the existence of billionaires and, and so on that have grown grown up in China is something that that would um, that would worry people in in North Korea that they would. That they would seek to avoid, that they would see as uh, 
creating problems of, of social instability. So I think I, when, I, when I said that uh, in my opening remarks, which Claude picked up on when he responded to me, that, uh, that uh, North Korea could be more innovative and flexible in some ways than, than China, I didn't mean to suggest that that was an across the board formula that, that the North Koreans were going to be more laissez-faire than, than the Chinese, certainly not. But just to underline that the, that, that, the, that the picture is more complex and more variegated than, than, uh, than people uh, propose. And it is not simply that the, the Chinese are like this and the North Koreans are like that and, and one, must, one must copy the other. That it's a lot more complex and there's a lot, lot of um, individual cases. I think that um, it's not, you know, you have um, interesting things happening in, in the North Korean economy, but I've not really had a chance to, to look at it firsthand for some years. Uh, but you have interesting things that uh, clearly uh, there, are, there are markets, there are street stalls selling, selling food and snacks and so on. There are, you know, there are individually operated restaurants. Uh, there is a lot of talk. Um, Kim Jong-un is placing huge emphasis on uh, economic efficiency and, and improving the economy. This has been a really constant theme, particularly this year at the party congress, first of all in January, and then a, a plenum of the central committee after that, an enlarged meeting of the cabinet, some other meetings this week, uh, and looking at different ways of uh, enterprise management, enterprise autonomy, uh, and so on, which are the, you know, which clearly indicate the ways that they're looking to, to improve and, and develop the economy with uh, rational management structures uh, and so on. And I think that's also possibly another similarity with, with China in, is that uh, the, the West, um, in the period after 1989 to 1991, many people in the West advised the kind of big bang economic transformation in the former Soviet Union, some of the countries of Eastern Europe. And that, uh, that in many cases resulted in quite severe social consequences in, uh, in, in plummeting living standards and so on. The, the Chinese, uh, economic changes have been much more incremental uh, from from 1978 onwards. Uh, for example, starting in, in the countryside, or and then moving to the towns, and, and finally to the cities, or creating special economic zones like Shenzhen, and then extending the result, reforms up the Pearl River Delta, uh, up to Shanghai, and then further into the rest of the country. And, the Chinese always use the expression for this of that they're crossing the river by feeling the stones. So it's been this incremental and experimental uh, way of, of, of change and development, allowing things to be tried out on a pilot basis, corrected where necessary, modulated uh, as necessary, rather than the big bang economic transformation. Uh, and I think that uh, in general terms, if not necessarily in every uh, specific policy aspect, this would that clearly uh, the North, North Korea is interested in an in an experimental, incremental uh, way of, of um, improving and developing their economy rather than a, a big bang uh, transformation. Thank you very much, Keith. Now we have a dilemma because uh, it's more or less the time we should close the webinar but the topic is interesting uh, we have f fabulous speakers i must say they're very very interesting also in the diversity and uh, we also have quite interesting questions which are coming from from you so i suggest the following i will read some of the questions that very kindly mr marion has uh, uh, pre-selected, read some of the questions so that the panelists can pick up some of those questions to answer. I will also have two questions on my own. So we will do a melting pot of all those questions and the four panelists feel free to answer some of those questions the way you want. Because we are already 
beyond the time limit, let's try to be not too long. Uh, but so that everybody could answer those questions and give kind of a final statement. So I read first the questions which are coming from the auditors. One of the questions is, could a first step towards peace and unity being a rapprochement in a sort of two federal states they could merge over time to avoid the feeling of an economic takeover, for example, East German experience. This is something which we hear very often at, in the diplomatic circles, and uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. The difference in results between the former Obama-Biden administration and the Trump administration, uh, which policies brought better results? Um, Personally, we'll be very prudent on this one, but everybody can express themselves. Um, another question is, question from Russia. What exactly the DPRK should change its wrong, inverted commas, path of development to some correct ones? I think it's very interesting. In this matter, all problems are often associated with DPRK. Is it fair? Should we always have one guy who's guilty, DPRK, and the other one is not guilty? So, well, how should we handle that? One condition to successful communication and cooperation is the equal value of both sides. Can South Korea or and the wider picture Europe, USA, accept North Korea as a partner of equal values for negotiation about a possible unification, or are we considering ourselves as superior anyhow? In which kinds of values both sides of Korea could find a common ground? It's a very, very interesting question. And uh, whenever you negotiate a peace agreement, whatever on the planet, if you consider that uh, one is good and the other one is bad, or they have, you have a value judgment, uh, it fails. So it's quite interesting question. Then I see that Irina would have a few points she still would like to give, so that will be possible. My, personally, my two questions. We heard from Tal that happiness is the differential between expectation and what you actually get. I think it's true. Internet. Probably what happened in East Germany would have been different if the people of East Germany didn't have a window on the West. Whereas South Korea, uh, North Korea is much less connected. If you open to internet, which kind of expectation will that bring? How can the system in North Korea handled that. I travel extensively in the region. I was very surprised to see in North Korea, you basically have very little access to internet, a little bit you have, but very little access to internet and definitely not the social media. In China, you have internet, but many of the Western social media are blocked and in vietnam which is also a country where the communist party wants to continue to rule but having opened the economy you have a relatively free access to both internet and the social media and i understand that the government of vietnam is using internet basically like a parliament in the sense that they are really checking electronically what are all the positions? And when they feel that there is something which is very, very strongly expressed on the internet, 
it means that there is a popular demand. So my question is, how do you relate the opening of the net and the ratio expectation versus what you have and the level of satisfaction or the risk of a blast? Second question, much easier to express. If we go too fast in the integration of the two systems of North and South, it's most likely never going to happen. So there is a certain speed management. It's also probably easier to start with small scale industries than with a very, very heavy big industry. Question, what are your views about the speed of the transformation so that it works and again you do not have a crash? So the members of the panel feel free now, I personally will shut up, feel free to answer any of the questions which you heard Please don't be too long because if not, one will speak and uh, the auditors will leave the webinar little by little and the last one will have nothing to say. Or we'll have to say, but nobody listening. In the order you want, answer the question you want and make kind of a final statement, but try to limit yourselves to something like three, four minutes. Thanks. Maybe I can can have a start because we yeah. are already over the time and have to uh, shift into the, the the next meeting. Uh, um, maybe the, the the question with the with the two countries, uh, uh, what, what what you what you proposed or what was proposed in the in the chat. In my, in my eyes, it is an an interesting idea on the very small level uh, it, it it has already been tried in in uh, doing uh, sports in in olympics uh, uh, etc uh, together so this could be uh, a point and what is what is really interesting is a question uh, from russia is there only one guilty uh, well life is complicated and, and politics is is complicated uh, but to be honest um Yes, in, in a conflict, there are, there are a lot of us aspects. Uh, but if you if you if you close your country uh, and you have no respect to to human rights, um, that, then of course it is very obvious um, who who is a bad cop in in this in this topic. So maybe um, uh, maybe this, these two questions for me. Uh, thank you again for for inviting me for for debating with you. Um, it was it has been a pleasure, and uh, I hope we can uh, uh, go on uh, with this debate, especially to Claude. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you, Denis. Hopefully, one day we do something concrete yes. in the direction of the reunification. That's the purpose. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank Who you. Else I would be, like now to speak. I will be very happy to um, face the same question, if possible. Very briefly, I'll do it. Uh, the, the idea of federal state combined by the north and the south is very tempting. It sounds initially as answering the basic uh, difficulty, uh, but it uh, creates an interim a period of time by which the North is creating its own environment, its own uh, regions and so on, economy, technology, step by step, trying to catch up. Uh, but the, uh, on the same time, it meets the regime who is going to protect the, the borders. The ex-DPRK army is not going to exist anymore. It's going to be the Southern Guards coming with the tanks and with the infantry in order to protect the border. On the Yellow River, for instance, <clears throat> what feeling will it give to, to the citizens of the North? Uh, who will be the policeman if I have a problem? And I uh, address to the policeman, who will he be? And if he comes from the South, it doesn't matter that he has a uniform, he has a Southern 
accent. So we are talking about a very complex uh, situation. Uh, I hope it may give the possibility of the north for the north to advance slowly, pace by pace. But it will tackle many, many difficulties of self-esteem, as I said before, of belonging to the system, of finance from one side, and uh, not being happy by the other side. Uh, maybe better, maybe not. I'm not sure. Thank you. Thank you, Tal. Um, uh, if I may, I would like to pick up a question about uh, speed of economic development. Uh, well, uh, in my personal opinion, the state of the North Korean economy at this moment is so that even small input will give a very big incremental increase uh, in economic growth. So the speed of transformation will be high in any way if it opens up. And uh, perhaps the worry would be that um, the transformation, economic transformation, is adequate to other transformation, social transformation, political transformation, ju juridical transformation, so that everything goes at the same speed. Otherwise, we will have big voids or in legislation, in other things that will uh, present a very prolific ground for various also illegal activities. And, uh, it's important to think about that. And uh, uh, on the point of small enterprises with Claude, I, I completely agree that it's uh, very, it, it'll be very difficult initially to start with small scale, with large scale enterprises and perhaps small scale will be the right way to go. And I would add that um, also reform in agriculture will be inevitable because if you look at the East Asian experience, even at the Chinese experience, everything has started with allowing free trade in agricultural surplus or in other light manufactured goods. So it's important to let market forces um, uh, mature over time so that to handle other uh, industrial products and more complicated products and uh, I think it'll, it, it's important. And another point, we have to think about the digital transformation because it has been going on in the West, also in Russia for several decades at various speeds, of course, with various results, but Moscow will have to, to leap on it and somehow integrate. So it won't have only dual economy with backward industries and with uh, very sophisticated modern industries, but it will have also a digital sector. And so how you combine all these three levels of economies that it will have to address at the same time is uh, also important. And when we can answers to the North Korean economic development, we have to think about that as well from just uh, the economic policy point of view. Thank you. Thank you so much. I my very uh, summary conclusion is unexpectedly we had a debate about the economy we hardly spoke about the economy we spoke about values mm -hmm. which is quite good and mm -hmm. i think for me if there are two words which come out from that webinar one, although it was not used, but I think it's the summary of the spirit of what the four participants said, it's respect. For any possibility to agree and rebuild a joint Korean peninsula, there must be mutual respect. It's the base on which we can build something. If not, you can bring whatever economic model, it will fail. Respect. And the other side, it was very much said by Tal, but by all of you, in a way, the human factor. And I think if there is respect, and if there is a recognition for the human factor, we are at the heart of the solution. That's my conclusion. Reappeared. So we will leave the word of the end to that was raised about could a first step to peace and unity be two federal states? I think this is this is really important. This was actually what was proposed by uh, President Kim Il Sung as far back as October 1980 um, at the Sixth Congress of the Workers' Party of Korea, where he talked about a confederal republic with um, one state but two systems and 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 two governments. 
And I think this addresses some of the points that have been made about uh, dangers of dangers and costs of, of absorption and, and so on, to, to see this at least as a, a kind of transitional uh, form. My understanding of it is perhaps a little bit different from Tal's in that uh, I think that that is precisely designed not to have, for example, South Korean troops on, on, the, on the Yalu, and I think that feeds into the regional issues as well. We mustn't forget that uh, China lost possibly several hundred thousand people to prevent that eventuality in the 50-53 war, and China was a much weaker country then than it is, than it is now. Differences between Obama and Biden administration and Trump administration, well, the bottom line is that they, they both failed. I think the, the difference was that Obama came into office pledging to talk to the United States enemies and failed to do so. Um, the Trump administration came into office saying they wouldn't talk, more or less, uh, but actually did. I think President Trump was held back perhaps by some of unrealistic expectations on his part, uh, but also I think that people like Mon Mike Pompeo and particularly John Bolton were responsible for not allowing him to pursue a course of dialogue which may have uh, yielded um, a bit better results. On the question of common values and, and, and reunification, of course, generations have changed and, and grown up and we get a lot of talk that uh, people in South Korea, young people in South Korea are now less interested in reunification. That's obviously there's a lot to that. But I think it's also that whenever the Korean people do have an opportunity to exchange with one another and those those occasions have obviously been far too few but those barriers of, re of division seem to melt very quickly, whether it's been at times of cultural exchanges, whether it's when the um, South Korean small and medium-sized enterprises in particular were operating in Kaesong, or when a delegation with uh, Kim Jong-un's younger sister went to South Korea for the Winter Olympics. One sees how quickly uh, the Korean people have a, a wish to, to, to come together. Obviously that can't be a straightforward thing, uh, but I think the, the human factor there is, is terribly important. And I'll leave it for there, if I may. And once again, thank you for inviting me. It's been, a, a, for me, a wonderful uh, meeting. And my apologies for the technical mix-up a little while ago. Keith had the word of the end. Thank you so much. Thank you to Chantal for the organization. Uh, thank you to Jacques Marion as well. I think we are on a good track and a webinar like that should be more than just a collection of opinion we should try to find a direction and to move and to make things progress thanks all the best to everybody